Welcome back, everyone, to the Heights podcast. I'm excited to have Heather Kim join us for this episode. Uh, Heather, you probably know her from her amazing podcast that she co-hosts, Abiding Together. She also is a co-founder with her husband, Jake, who I know a little bit personally, uh, the ministry Life Restoration Ministries. And so Heather has a wide range of ministry experience over 25 years, and we're just excited to have her. So thanks for being with us. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for asking me. Yeah. So Heather, could you just share a little bit before we dive into the podcast, just about the work that you do, your ministry, how you got to doing this Abiding Together podcast and life restoration in particular? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. In some ways, I don't know how to answer it because it just seems like you say yes to one thing and then you say yes to the next thing and you say yes to the next thing. And then you find yourself on this wonderful adventure, which just seems to be how God works. I was just listening to a little clip from uh, Father Cantala Mesa this morning, who's the the papal preacher. And he was just saying there was, there was a moment where I said yes to God. And I said yes to, to his will being primary in my life. And he said, and that changed everything. And he said, that's how everything else has happened in his life. And I was like, amen, that, that feels very similar to me too. You know, I had an encounter with God at a young age, just 14. And it seems like ever since then, and this invitation to say yes to, to him, to relationship with him and following him, uh, has just catapulted me into places that I would never, never have imagined. So I actually joined a ministry team right out of high school, which is similar to net. It was like a retreat ministry for young young people, teens and young adults. We traveled around in a van and lived in community <laughs> and stuff like that. So that's kind of where it started. I went, went to Franciscan to get trained. So did theology and catechetics to try to back up some of the things that were happening in my, in my heart with like rooted in good church teaching. Yeah. And then from there, you know, got involved in youth ministry for a while, was speaking, but then I had kids and I was just sort of like, raising kids like for a long time and just sort of here and there doing what I could in the diocese supporting um, the archbishop and and various things uh, and then we you know we had a lot of friends in ministry and so uh, one guy his name was Gene Montrostelli he was like into podcasts way early on he's just a genius and all of that and he asked me one day he was like um, what would you think about doing a podcast and I was like what like it just caught me so off guard and I was like I no, like I would not do that. Like I'm a pretty shy person when it comes to things like that. And um, I said, I would never do something like that, you know, by myself. And I don't even know how to do it. And I kind of was very dismissive and he just kept coming back to it in the conversation. And he said, well, what if you could do it with, with friends? And I was already like had this deep friendship with Michelle Bensinger and sister Miriam James Hyland, who I do the podcast with now, but um, we had been journeying together for many years and just having these really rich, fruitful conversations that were fruitful for all three of us. And I was like, well, that would really bless people. Like if I think about what I wished I had, which was people were, who were a few steps ahead of me, kind of giving me some direction, like that would really be a blessing. And so I mentioned them and he said, well, what if I did, you know, all of the background stuff for you that you don't know how to do? And then you'd be faced with the real reason why you're saying no to me yeah. right now. And I was like, oh, like he just kind of sort of like tagged me with my, my, I think in some ways, like I just, I was scared. Like, I think underneath it, there was like a fear of like, I don't know how to do this. I don't, how do I use my voice like that? Like, I don't really know. So um, I had a conversation with the girls. I said, I, I think we should pray about this. And one thing leads to another. So we end up saying yes. And that's what I meant. Like you just say one little yes. We're like, yes, Lord, we're open to whatever you want to do, which honestly, I had no idea what would happen. And I just thought, oh, this will just be a little thing. We'll hop on some microphones. Like we just have our normal conversations. Yeah. And then, well, the Holy and Spirit showed are. up and then it exploded. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so how, that's many episodes, about... how many episodes have you guys recorded? Uh, how long has, how, and how many I years? Actually, yeah, it's been seven years. So Oh, wow. There's a, I don't okay. even know how many episodes. There's been a lot of episodes because for the most part, it's a weekly podcast. Um, and we have like discussion questions and stuff that we offer to people because we want them to have their own conversations, to meet up with a friend or a small group and and to really dive deep into their own hearts and their own relationships. Um, but yeah, it like we've taken breaks in the summer and for a while we just took a pause. But yeah, that's been going on. And then I also speak at conferences, do a lot of women's events. We host, Jake and I both host men's and women's retreats here locally, um, which a lot of people come from all over the place for. But 
Yeah. We do a whole bunch of different things. We love leaders. We pour into leaders. We really are about healing hearts, uh, letting, like providing opportunities for God to show up and heal people. And I think it's just all of that is coming out of our own story, our own encounters with God, what he's been doing in our life. And then and then sharing that, which is really the call for all of us, no matter where we find ourselves, whether it be on a stage or a platform or in our home or in our mm-hmm. school or workplace, that we would just say yes to God and then allow him to speak through the ways that he's moving in our life, you know? Yeah. So as, I mean, you've written a book, a couple books, how many books? One, two? Two, two couple, books. Two yeah. books. Two. You're a speaker, podcaster. Is this, Was this natural to you? Or was it like, oh my gosh, I feel called to all of this. It's not natural to me, but I'm going to just trust in God. Or has it just been a natural fruit, you know, out of that encounter? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been a, it's been a fruit in that it just sort of has happened. Like some people will say to me, oh, I want to be like a Catholic speaker. Like, how do I do that? And I was like, first of all, you probably, if you want to be a Catholic speaker, you probably shouldn't be, but just because what's involved, you know, it's a lot. Like you, you have to be willing to go through the fire and the pressing and the real journeying deep with God to, to have something to say, you know, and, and that's constantly the question. We could all get up and share a whole bunch of things, but if the Holy Spirit isn't on it, if it's not coming from an authentic place of real conversion and encounter with Jesus, then I don't think there's any point in saying it. So, um, So, yeah, I mean, it has been a fruit, but at the same time, like I said, you know, I was a pretty shy person. I was paralyzingly shy when I was younger and I took a a acting class when I was in uh, high school and that alone, I think was God. Like even in the natural things, I think he was moving because what I received there, one, the teacher was fantastic and he really loved us well. And that's what kind of captivated me at first was the relationship. But he taught me things of how to be able to deal with this shy side that kept sort of like clamping my voice down. And I look back now, it's only through looking back that you go, wow, Lord, you really work all things for good. You really do. You take all the things, all the little yeses. When we say yes to you, you start moving in our life in imperceptible ways to lead us into where you're calling us to be. So, so yeah, it's a fruit of all of those things. And um, I'm grateful to be able to, yeah, yeah, to see God move in this way, really. It's, yeah. it's a privilege. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for just your yes. I mean, over 25 years of of really following the Lord is is beautiful. I mean, I've just in my own life the past couple of years, different trials or challenges, you know, I'm sure you've had it as well, where it's like, Lord, why, why am I following you? Like, you've abandoned me. I feel like you've abandoned me. But uh, just thank you for your yes. Stay, stay in the course with him. Um, so I'm really excited in, in this podcast, everyone, we're going to be talking about particularly youth Gen Z struggles they're dealing with, but also, you know, parents, parents, raising kids in today's cultural climate. And I'm just excited to hear from Heather because she has over 25 years of walking with people, youth and parents and journeying of healing and freedom encounter. So Heather, what, I mean, what you're seeing through your own travels, your own work, what what would you say is something, a unique struggle maybe that youth today are dealing with compared to say when you were a youth, mm-hmm. or maybe you see some similarities and just different fruits that come out of a, that particular wound. But yeah, what would you say in general that young people, you might even include someone like me who's 28, young adult, uh, what, what do you see is kind of an underlying or wound or struggle that Mm -hmm. that you're just seeing repeated yeah i i must say i do have three kids of my own so just i I have some experience in this category as well just on a personal level my youngest just graduated from high school and is starting at franciscan and then i have a 21 year old and a 19 year old so they're all kind of in the mix right now but um I honestly, I think a lot of the wounds that we see are similar to how they've always been. I think that's part of understanding us as human beings is that they're, if we look back at the garden, scripture, I think helps explain our life. So I'm in scripture all the time. But if we go back to the garden, we, we initially see God's plan was that we would be in deep relationship with him. That's what we're made for when we're says, you know, we're made in the image and likeness of God. He is a God of relationship. He's a Trinity of persons. You know, they have relationship with each other. And if that's the image that we're made in, like that's where we will receive the most life is in relationship with him and with others. And when there was a break in the relationship, what we see there is that the enemy came in and started whispering 
lies and suggestions to Adam and Eve to have them question the heart of God. So for the first time they start to go like, is God really good? Like, does he really want the best things for me? Um, maybe there's another way, maybe there's another thing to receive like goodness in life and, and all of that. And as we know, they, they go against God's plan and everything unravels. And we see the destruction and the fruit of that all throughout scripture, but that too is happening in our own hearts. So there's, there's this mini version of that. That's very personal to each of us there. We were made in God's image and like this, you and me on a personal level, God wants to be in intimate union with us, but the enemy likes to whisper suggestions to us that cause us to question the heart of God. And in turn, there's a lot of other things that we go to other than him, other voices that we're listening to that land us in places where we end up being very far from God and, and honestly, deeply wounded, fractured within ourselves. So where God wants unity, suddenly we're experiencing all kinds of fracturing within ourselves. And that's what hurts so much, you know? that's where it hurts. So, so painful for us in the places where we haven't been loved well, where people have rejected us, where we've been abandoned. And so in that sense, I think we're all coming from a same place. And it's important to know that the human condition is that we suffer from this fracturing with God every time we turn to other things and look to other voices to tell us who we are. Uh, and then I think it gets kind of more specific and unique as to how that plays out. So I think at the heart of it, like there's a, a lot of us are really struggling with identity right now. We see that. And, and some people might go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they want to just wipe the, just like pass this off right now as I say it. But I'm like, there is a deep thing happening in the heart of us where we are looking to other people and other things to tell us who we are, or we're trying to make that decision ourselves. And I think that that that's one thing that we've got, um, that's always been there, the questioning of identity. Um, that was like when I was a kid, you know, there's all kinds of things in there. But I think right now it's under specific assault and it's playing out in very dramatic and painful ways for people. Um, so, yeah, I, I think one thing that we get wrong right now is that we think identity is something we choose but it's actually something that's given to us as a gift by God. It's bestowed upon us. And we can see that in scripture, like even when Jesus steps into the, the, the river to be baptized and, you know, you hear the voice of the father saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what's interesting about that is it's before Jesus did any of his miracles, before he did anything, he didn't have to prove himself to receive that blessing from God. The father is just saying, I'm bestowing like this identity upon you. You are my son. And I love you. I'm pleased with you. I delight in you beyond anything that you can do just because of who you are. And, and I think that we're desperate to hear that right now. Young people, old people, young adults, it doesn't matter across the board. Um, the enemy is radically assaulting that, that area in our life. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, do you think it's the opposite right now? What's going on is like, Hey, you need to like get your act together or you need to perform or you need to do this and then you'll be lovable or then you'll be enough. Like, what do you, I mean, the confusion of identity and the battle of identity is, can be, you know, in so many different variable, you know, in different ways, but what do you think youth are being told? Are they being told, Hey, your identity is just whoever you want to be. And we're going to celebrate you, whatever you want to do or whatever you want to be. Or would you say there might be just something deeper, whether that's a lie that's being whispered where you know, you're alone. So you got to take things into your own hands. Um, I mean, is there a common theme to what that identity is being pushed or the lie that you're seeing? Does that, does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Uh, I think uh, it's probably yes to all of those things, but um, it's important to, for us to realize that the second that we turn away from looking to God as the one who has the answers, the one that we receive from, the one who has given us our very life, the one who loves us more than anyone who knows us, who sees us, who gets us on every level. And we start looking to other things and particularly ourselves to say, actually, I think I'm going to decide. I'm going to decide all of those things. And somehow I think that I know the best thing for myself. And I mean, it's just when we step back, we go, that's actually ridiculous. Because often when I think I know what's best, it leads me down a pathway where more heartache occurs. Like if I thought that I probably would have married three other people before Jake, and it would have ended in absolute disaster because at the time I was sure this is for sure what has to happen. And I know what's best for me. And all along, 
uh, yeah, we could we can find ourselves in places where we think that we get to define all of that when we when we have to choose it. And I think there's something about that too that's really rattling on a deep, deep level. Is that suddenly everything's up for grabs? Suddenly I have to figure out everything. Suddenly, um, no one in authority uh, who loves me is going to let me see what is true and good. And so it's extremely confusing. So now we're looking to all kinds of voices. Those voices contradict each other. And I think that this is part of what is creating so much anxiety in our young people and in the world today. It's not their fault. You yeah. know, there's competing voices all over the place that are telling all of us things that just aren't true and they're not going to lead to life. And so I think, you know, the, the, the remedy is, is a return to uh, scripture for one, like this explains our life. It's not just some old book full of stories. Um, God is revealing his plan, his, uh, what is good for us, the way to live that is going to lead to actual joy and peace and contentment and the fullness of life. Um, but also just a return to like what we would call like a Catholic worldview. There's a reason why it works because it makes sense because it's based on God's word and, and who he is. And, and right now all of those competing voices. And I think the failure in leadership across the board, even within the church, but you have political failures, of leadership, like people that you just can't trust over and over again, which I think is another tactic of the enemy to say, you can't trust anybody. You're going to have to figure it out yourself. You know, COVID, wh how that played out with like all the competing voices that were in contradiction to each other. It's left all of us. And I think especially our young people going, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to have to figure it out. Yeah. And and my heart just breaks there because I'm like, we're not meant to just figure it out and like go through life randomly choosing things, hoping for the best or like white knuckling our way through life. Uh, because I think what that's leading to is a lot of pain, a lot of yeah. wounds, a lot of things that, that all of us are struggling with that we are, God does not intend for us. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Do you, uh, as you're just talking, I'm reminded of something, Dr. Mary Hassan, do you know who she is? She founded Person and Identity Project. She's kind of one of the leading experts in the church going around educating bishops on just the LGBTQ movement and the church's response. But I one time asked her, like, hey, what's all this rooted in? Like, like what's mm -hmm. I want to know, like, where this came from exactly. And, you know, you can talk about different philosophies or anthropologies or and she just said, you know, the enlightenment and the rejection of God, because, mm -hmm. with you know, as John Paul II says, without God, the creature grows unintelligible. And I think, you know, we've, we've heard a lot in the church and just like we're in a post-Christian era and time where a lot of people are rejecting God. And in turn, we don't know who we are, you know, in our identity, like, well, it's just up for grabs. But what's the fruit of that? Well, we're seeing the fruit of that. You know, it's the breakdown of the family, greater loneliness or depression. Um, you know, what, what would you say to, to parents who, you know, are wanting to be faithful, you know, wanting to follow the Lord, have the b biblical word worldview, but also to teach and educate and form their own kids, but they see maybe their kids being pulled by what the world is telling them about who they are or what their fulfillment or what they should do with their life. Maybe you've experienced this your own self as a parent. I mean, mm -hmm. I, unless your kids are perfect, I, I don't know why they're perfect. <laughs> but they're the best. They Let me just, yeah. I'll just say that. Yeah, the best. Yeah, Not I mean, perfect. They, they could be perfect. And maybe you're wrong. Yeah. But no, maybe no, time, no. just even in your own experience of ways that you've seen maybe your kids being pulled by different ideas or lies, mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how is all of this impacting, you know, parents? you know, in particular, I mean, I, I assume that it's just hard and brutal. And that's why you have some parents that just throw in the towel and say, I give up, I'm not going to have kids in today's cultural, mm -hmm. you know, culture. Mm -hmm. um, so what, you know, what are you seeing in your own ministry from parents? Yeah, a couple things. First of all, I, I think that parents underestimate their role. And I think uh, right now, because of those competing voices I was talking about, parents have really questioned whether or not they know what is good for their kids. So they keep going to other experts. Now, 
I, I go to counseling. I go to other people who can speak into my life. So I'm not saying don't do that. But along the way, I think for many parents, there's actually been an abdication of their role that God has given them in their authority as parents, their God-given authority to be able to have wisdom, like the gifts of the spirit being active in their life, to have wisdom and discernment and counsel and all of those things to be able to navigate their own children. These are gifts given to us by God. And although we may need other people and support and help, I think what is happening a lot right now is that parents are looking to so many other sources that they actually have abdicated their own God-given authority in raising their children and speaking life there. And there's some basic things that I think parents can do. One is we need to um, reflect on what are the messages that we want our kids to know. So my husband, Jake's a counselor. We think about this stuff probably way too much more than other people. So from a very young age, we, you know, for our kids, we wanted them to know certain things that were important, that were essential. Like you're, you're loved. We, we choose you. You're no matter what you do, we're always going to be with like all of those types of identity things like that we wanted to speak into their life, not just like saying all those things like a litany, but in the real moments of life, being affirming, like offering blessing, because we want to reflect as an image of God, what he does as a father, what he is trying to bestow upon them. We are the conduits of that for our own children. So I think those are some like essential things that we have to do. And that plays out all throughout their life. And when we get it wrong, when we are giving a message that maybe we don't intend or that's coming out of our own brokenness, like you better perform to, to get love or we start pulling away when they don't get it right, which is communicating something to our kids, we need to be able to ask for forgiveness and repair. So I think that's one category that we have to look at. Have I been abdicating my God-given authority as a parent in the lives of my children and looking to too many other things as if I don't know what to do, you know? Um, so I think we can stand our ground in that. And, and the second thing is, um, I, I'll just tell you a story, a personal story. So one of my kids has said, I'm allowed to share this about them, but <laughs> they're, they're great. They're a great kid. And, and I will say, no matter what you do as a parent, the onslaught of what the world and the enemy is doing in their lives, you cannot avoid that. You know, you can't take them out of the world completely. They're going to get it. It's going to be happening in their own hearts. So just know that there's a battle going on and we are waging war, you know, and Christ has won the victory, but we have to get in the battle because it's going on. So we are giving our kids all of these positive messages and affirmation and trying to grow them in the faith and all of those things. But here comes the big bad world, friendships, people who are going to reject them and, and what the enemy is whispering into their life. And so I noticed with one of our kids that they were just like in the middle of high school starting to get more isolating. You know, they're like going up to their room more, just separating themselves more. When I would say certain things, there was this look on their face of like, kind of suspicion about whether I actually intended something good for them or whether I was just trying to like ruin their life, you know, or whatever, something dramatic that was going on. And at first, you know, as a parent, you go, well, maybe it's a phase, maybe it's just, you know, so you kind of give room for stuff like that. And, and it just started increasing. And so we got them to start seeing a counselor. They wanted to do that. And it actually started to make it worse. <clears throat> so the feasting on their inner world and all of their feelings and all of their emotions started to become, uh, like a, a bigger issue. So suddenly they're more isolated, more depressed, more anxious. Um, and, and I started to notice this like at a pretty big degree. And so I intervened one day and I said, do you remember a couple of years ago? Like you're actually pretty different. So bringing in perspective, you actually were like lighter and more joyful. And I said, it seems like things have really taken a turn. And they looked at me with that suspicion of like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know me, you know, and I remember that attitude myself as a teenager. So we get that. Uh, and anyway, it sent them on this journey where they were like, I actually went upstairs. They told me later, like, I went upstairs and grabbed my, my old journals to prove you wrong. And what I found in there was that you were right. And they came downstairs later. And this had been over the course of two years. So this isn't just like, oh, this happened over you know, a couple of days. Like there's wrenching things happening in the hearts as a parent and for the child too. And so you're praying, you're advocating, you're asking the Holy Spirit to come. You're trying to put them in situations where they can encounter God. And there's just like no breakthrough. And it's like, be persistent parents. Don't give up when you are in a fight for your kid's heart um, because the enemy's not going to give up. That's for sure. So we can't give up. Anyway, they came downstairs one night with the journal in hand and just said, um, so I went up there, you know, to find my journal and prove you wrong. And I, 
and I read back it to who I was and you were right. I was just, there was so much more joy and I was positive and all this stuff. And that's just not there anymore. And I also wrote to myself in my old journal to my future self. And they started to read to me what they wrote. And it was like, don't forget, you know, that God loves you. Don't forget. And I know that right now you're struggling in this and this. It's almost like they were like, had this prophetic voice into their future self. And they sat there looking at me and my eyes are welling up with tears and their eyes are welling up with tears. And it was so clear that Jesus was in the room. And I just, they were like, I can see it. I have not been myself. And I said, Christ, the light is here. And they said, I know. <laughs> yeah, the, like this is a 16 year old, right? Like having this conversation. And so as we've unpacked that over the last several months, what, what we've sort of identified is it was like they were living in the upside down, like that shows stranger things, you know, where there's this upside down world where it's full of darkness. It's hard to breathe in there where life is being sucked out of them. And, and my child was just describing that experience. They were like, when I actually came out of it, it's like I could breathe again. Like I had just popped out of this darkened world where everything that I was looking at was like with this negative lens of like, everybody's out to hurt me. Like I need to protect myself. I want to be seen. And simultaneously, I don't want anybody to notice me. Like I'm terrified when I walk into situations and they were just, all of this is whirling around in their inner world. And it was just full of lies and deception from the enemy. And they didn't know how to stand on their own two feet. And so we've been talking about what does it look like to now fight for real life and real living, you know? And it's like, we have to get into scripture. I don't care if you're 14, 12, 80, it doesn't matter how old you are. Like this, this is God's word. He will speak to you wherever you are and he wants to speak to us. Um, but I think arming ourselves with the truth is of absolute necessity right now in the world that is full of lies and deception. And it's ultimately very, very confusing. And the focus on our opinions and our feelings and having that be almost like the God in our life that's driving everything, how I feel in one moment or one day, dictating then my actions throughout my entire life. I think that's a massive deception from the enemy. And and it's not leading to good things. I think if we all zoom out, if any young person is honest and they zoom out of their life, they could say, it's not going great. Yeah. I, f I don't feel happy. I feel really nervous. I feel unsettled. I don't know if I'm loved. I'm questioning who I am on like a very deep level. And, and I'm, I just want to say like, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, this is not how you were meant to live. This is not God's plan or desire for you. And he wants to draw close to each of us and breathe his life into us and set us free. It's like we're in a cage, like we're in the upside down, you know, and we don't know how to get out. And Jesus is the way. He is the way out. He is the freedom. He breaks the chains. He's the way maker. I know there's a song about this, but it's because it's true. You know, like all of those things are actually true. It's not just a story. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what would be your advice for like a, a youth who might be listening to this? They're, they're in high school. Like, would you say the first thing, like dive into scripture, like you need to be reading the word of God. You need to be praying because I, you know, I think, you know, why would a youth feel lonely or not enough? Like, is it, would you say really it's at home like that, you know, the parents and just the breakdown of the family? Is it media? Is it at their school? Just the culture in general, just all across the board? You know, what would you say to a youth who they feel like they're in the dark? They don't know why, maybe due to their sin or other people's sin, but maybe they just don't know. And they feel like they're confused, you know, and they want, they want to follow Christ. You know, what would you say to them in the midst of their, in their pain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the midst of their pain, what I want to say is you're not alone. You're not like that. That is one lie. For, he is, there is an enemy who is lying to you. That's one thing that we're going to have to wake up to. There is an enemy that's lying to you. And more importantly than that, there is a God who deeply loves you and he sees you. He made you. He wants to be in relationship with you and he's real. The Jesus who walked the earth 2000 years ago is real. He's still doing miracles now. He's drawing close to people now and he can give you power 
that you don't have on your own. And this is what the Christian life is. If you're a baptized Christian, if you go to mass, whatever, Jesus is saying, I want to put my very life in you so that you can do things through my power that you can't do on your own. And that's when amazing things start to happen. So I would say it starts with, yeah, just will you open your heart to Jesus? Like in the quiet of your own heart and mind, like in your bedroom at night when no one else is there, like, will you go to him with some of those questions? And it could be as simple as Jesus, will you come into my heart and will you bring your light? That's one yeah. prayer that I would say, ask him to bring his light and his truth. And even if that's the only prayer that you pray every day for a long time and have a heart to receive it, I think things will begin to change. Secondly, yeah, I mean, you can Google like a few questions on what does God have to, what is to, uh, scriptures on God's love or, you know, scriptures on peace and anxiety or anything that is happening in your world, just use Google to your benefit and it will give you scriptures that you can begin to sort of like read through and go, okay, like this is actually God talking to me. He's not just saying it to like the universe. Um, it's personal. So I'd say that I think we need community. We need friends and people, not just any kind of friends, but friends who want the same thing, like who want to live a different life, who are willing to start taking steps to follow the gospel. Um, so I think that's a, that's a simple starting point. I don't think it needs to be too complicated. There's a whole bunch of other things you can do, but I think it starts with an open heart and inviting yeah. Jesus there right where we need him. Yeah. I think I'm just reflecting on my own experience as you're talking to me and my journey, particularly in like college, a little bit in high school, but like it takes courage to get down on your knees and actually open your heart. Like it actually, it takes a lot of courage. You might not feel like it at all. Mm -hmm. And particularly, I, I remember just my journey of high school and college, it was like all my actions, not all of them, but most of them were based off of feeling, okay, this feels good. Or, oh, I feel consoled in this way. So I'm going to just go down this path. Mm -hmm. But you might you know, be like, okay, I've tried the church thing or I've tried praying and I just don't feel it. Or, or you know, I just, I'm not consoled. Mm -hmm. And it, ta yeah, it takes courage. It takes a lot of courage to say like, Lord, I don't get you at times. Like, I don't get what's going on, mm -hmm. but I, I want you to come into my life and show me the path. You know, I mm -hmm. talked with Christopher West once, um, who's been a great mentor of mine. And he, I was just telling him, I'm like, you know, at time, like this was, a few years ago, I was like, at times I'm just like, Lord, why am I following you? Like you haven't, mm -hmm. and it was all about, you haven't given me this. You haven't given me that. And he, he basically said, all right, Brendan, you have, you have two hands. He's like one hand, hold firm to the cross. Mm -hmm. He's like, don't let go. And on the other hand, start writing and journaling all of your anger and bitterness and everything. But he's like, but don't let go. Even if you don't get it, even if you're in pain and darkness, just mm -hmm. don't let go. And I thought that was just great advice uh, because at the end of the day, I think, you know, the Lord will strip us of certain things where he's going to say, I want you to make a heroic act of courage and faith mm -hmm. in me, even if you don't get it, because it's harder. It might be hard to follow me, but it's harder not to follow me. Mm -hmm. um, so, True. yeah, and that, that was just... Um, it, yeah, it helped me in my own faith. And that's kind of what I was just thinking about, but what would you say to, you know, parents in this? I mean, I would actually love to hear this. I don't know if I've ever asked anyone this, but like, what would be the number one advice you'd give? And again, this is, there's so many answers probably to this, but what would you, what would be the number one advice you would give to someone of how to be a good parent? Like, and maybe it's a little bit different in our culture today, particularly with what you've been talking about, the lies and identity lies. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can even address today, like if you could sit down with a group of parents and it was, hey, you're going to be given a little talk, a little presentation on what parents, this is the number one advice. This is what you need mm -hmm. to do in particular in today's culture with our youth and your kids. Um, is it just simply just keep loving them and don't give up? You know, what would, what would you say? Well, I mean, I can't boil it down to one thing. If I have to boil it down to one thing, then it might sound like, oh, obvious. It's not obvious. Follow 
Jesus. If you're a parent, like you need to be following Jesus. You need to open your heart to the Holy Spirit and be in deep relationship with the Father. If you are grounded in your identity as a son and daughter, because you're not just a mom or a dad, but if you're grounded in your identity as a, as a son and a daughter of God the Father, and you're receiving uh, the bestowing of his, you know, like goodness upon your life, you're going to feel a lot more settled in a lot of things and you're going to have something to offer. And when you open your heart to the Holy spirit and you're able to see things that no one else can see in the lives of your kids, where you're prompted by the spirit to ask one more question, or you just happen to glance over at just the right time to be able to catch something that has happened, Brendan, so many times in my parenting, because I beg the Holy spirit to guide me, to let me see the things that I can't see. This is what I was talking about, even for, for young people, but like, it's real. So when we're baptized, we receive gifts. The, the Holy Spirit becomes active. Jesus is living mysteriously right in us. This is why I mean you're never alone. Actually, never. He is right here. He resides within us. There's something really comforting about that when we come to know that, not just as an idea, but as a reality. So I would say following Jesus, being open to the Spirit, it's beyond showing up at church and doing all the right things. It's beyond like knowing the rules and trying to modify our behavior and then modify our kids' behavior. It's not about that. The behavior will follow a heart that has encountered Jesus out of love for him. will want to start changing and doing things. So yes, we need rules and yes, we need boundaries and all of that stuff, but that can't be the end. Not at all, nor necessarily do I think it's always the starting point. You know, it should always be about relationship. And from that place, we will be able to know how does God love in this situation? What would Jesus do? I'm wearing this stupid bracelet because it's totally old school, WWJD. I'm like, I actually don't think we're asking that question very much anymore. It's more, what will I do? What will the experts say to do? But really it is, what would Jesus do in this situation? Would he, you know, correct or would he, would he, just be present and love and be merciful here. Those questions have to be asked like in every moment of parenting. And then I think on other levels, it's like we need other parents who are in the same boat, who are really trying to be good parents. We need support. We also need to sit at each other's feet, receive wisdom, you know, to be able to know how to navigate all of these things. There's, there's a hundred other things that I think can make us good parents. But at the heart of it, I think relationship with Jesus for real not just checking the boxes yeah. and doing all the Catholic or Christian things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't planning on getting into this and, and feel free to, uh, if, if you don't want to talk about it, but, um, I remember cause I wanted, or, you know, you know, I, I hope you do share it because it's one of the most powerful stories that I heard at a talk that you gave mm -hmm. at seek a couple of years ago. And this just gives, um, the rea it shows that I think this story, if you don't mind sharing it, shows the reality of the power of the Holy Spirit in one's life if we open up heroically and courageously to him, to surrender to him, to invite him into our lives, to say, I will follow you. And it was a story about your, your dad mm -hmm. who was miraculously healed. Mm -hmm. And I remember you shared that story at Seek, and I was just like... Is everyone hearing this right now? Like, mm -hmm. um, do you mind sharing sure. it? Sure. Yeah, Brandon, this is what I'm saying. Jesus is real. He, it's yeah. not just like stories in a, in a book, in an old book. Like he's really real. So when I was a, a junior in high school, um, my dad, who was like a great businessman, hard worker, you know, all that stuff. He, he could basically, in my mind, do anything. He could own a room negotiating. He was just like a master of a lot of things. He was really gifted. Um, he was diagnosed with a stage four cancer, non-Hodgkin's large cell lymphoma. And they, it was, as they started to do tests, they realized it was the huge lump under his arm, but then it was in his lymph nodes. It, we would start to pray, Jesus, please don't let it, you know, wherever they were going to test next. And, and every time it seemed like the opposite of what we were praying. It was in his bloodstream. It was in his bone marrow. It was riddled through his entire body. And they basically just said, you know, Mr. McGuire, that's <laughs> it's my last, my last name. They said, uh, you probably have about three months to live. Then you need to prepare you know, get everything in order. And so he, you know, started some treatments and stuff like that, but they were really like, 
this isn't going to hit this like on every level that is needed. And, and this is where it brought my dad to his knees because he couldn't do anything about this. He couldn't work his way through it. He wasn't smart enough to figure it out. You can't, you're at your lowest like of poverty um, internally, you know, when you're faced with something like this. And I remember so many people were praying. And like I said, I just felt like God wasn't even listening because everything was opposite. But there was one day that he was in the cancer clinic in Vancouver and he was laying in his bed and there was this little Bible beside his bed, just a little New Testament that I think my mom left there. She's a good woman. Um, <laughs> and he picked it up to read it. He never read the Bible. Like he went to church on Sunday, but it was more out of obligation than anything. And they had just found a new group of tumors in his abdomen. And that's why he was there. They wanted to test, like just see, is there anything else they could do? Um, but it was looking horrible. And so he picked up the Bible and he read this story about God's forgiveness. And it really touched him. Like the Holy Spirit showed up and was speaking through God's word to him. It felt personal to him. And he was like, I've just felt really loved by God and had never had an experience like that. And so he closes the Bible and he opens it up again. And there's the story of the healing of the leper. And so he just puts the Bible on his chest and he just said this simple prayer. He just said, God, if it's your will, I just ask that you would heal me of this cancer and give me good health. And he had his eyes closed and he said, my dad's a very logical guy, so he doesn't talk like this. He said, it's like power and light just came rushing through my eye sockets and through my entire body. He said, I felt like I was like vibrating off the bed. Like it was sudden and intense. And he was like, I could just see colors, even though his eyes were closed. And um, he said, it was so intense that finally I like opened up my eyes and everything stopped. He's like, close my eyes again. You know, nothing. I opened them up again. He's like, just laying there in total disbelief. Like what the heck just happened to me? You know, and he called us later that night and we picked up the phone and all we heard was laughing on the other side. We're like, what, who is this? Or what is going on? And he said, it's me. He's like, something happened to me. And we were like, what? Like totally out of context. We're like, what is going on? You know, and we're like, my dad's dying. Maybe they've drugged him up. I don't know what's happening here, but, but this is weird. And, um, and so the next morning he went in for a scan to just look closer at that clump of tumors that they found. And uh, the doctor came up after and just said, Mr. McGuire, that was a very boring three hours because there's nothing there. And it was gone through his whole body. Like it was in his spleen, his bone marrow, all that stuff, like I said, and it was gone everywhere in an instant. It was gone. Yeah. Now tell me that Jesus isn't the way, (laughs) you know, tell me that he's not the life and the truth and everything that he says he is like, and that he's not able to do miracles right now, that it wasn't just when he walked the earth. Like I've seen this, this is one story of many stories that I've seen and experienced even in my own life. I've been set free from things. My husband, Jake, like things that the world is like, oh, you'll always struggle with this. I'm like, forget that. Like, that's not, that's not who Jesus is. That might be what doctors say. That might be, you know, what all the experts say, but we want to start operating out of not just this normal world, but really like we're sons and daughters of a God who has power to do things and raise people from the dead and change things that we can't change. And, and that's the Jesus that wants to come and encounter us in the deepest places of our heart. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus is real. Like, Jesus got me fired real. up there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. No, thank <laughs> yes, you for sharing is. that. Cause it yeah, gives, yeah. Just thank you for giving, it gives hope. I mean, it gives hope to me. I know it will give hope to people who listen, but it's, you know, wherever, you know, if there's parents listening to this and they have kids struggling, like maybe their hearts just like, I'm, I'm hopeless. Like mm-hmm. God's not doing anything. I, you know, it's like, no, he is, mm-hmm. but, keep going, keep going. Or maybe, you know, maybe there's some youth out there that are, um, in pain. It's like, Jesus is real and he can do something powerful in your life. And that story just is a testimony to that. So thank you, Heather, for giving that hope. And yeah, Yeah, thank you for, for yeah. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's great to be with you. Thanks for letting me share all of that. And yeah, I just, um, I'm going to leave just our conversation here to just pray for everybody who's listening to this, that, you know, Jesus would come and meet you right where you are and that he would come with his light and with his hope. Thanks, Heather.